Um, so I just wanted to start off with one of the things that really um, touched me a few years ago. Unfortunately, you can see the, the name of this chat. Um, the chap died recently, Joel Cavell, a wonderful guy and a wonderful book called The Enemy of Nature. And what he implored us is, is to think less about calling something like this an environmental crisis, a more an ecological one, um, and to see human beings as ecologically embedded, and not the environment as something outside of us, but we're part of it. Um, and that was uh, something that really touched me, because he also mentioned the importance of resources and energy. And that's something I was working on at the time. And I think his work, more than any other that I've read, uh, really brings home this ecologically embedded dimension uh, of human beings and the importance of resources. Uh, and the reason I want to focus on resources today is because the other thing I want to talk about was human responsibility. So Kiara's thankfully gone through all the human rights stuff I was going to do, so I don't have to do it now. Um, basically, I'll just, I'll just start with this, my favourite quote. The environment is humanity's first right, and that was from uh, the marvellous Ken Seller Weaver, who I'm sure at least some of you have heard of. Um, basically, human rights are about the minimally good life, right? guaranteeing the minimally good life for all. Uh, minimal standards, not some sort of utopia. Um, and in effect, what these uh, observers like Ken Sarawiwa would point out is that you need an environment in order to live a minimally good life. And that environment has to be of an adequate standard. So the human rights connections developed over time, and you know, to be fair, they're fairly simple. Um, but what we've started to see in the UN system now is a growing realization that protecting human rights can also protect the environment. And making sure that people have adequate knowledge about how their environment is going to be affected is an important element of planning and resource development. And that's what I've been working on the last few years, principally because what we've seen through numerous international energy agency reports is that our major reserves of fossil fuels are declining at between 6 and 9% every single year. And these are conventional reserves, the stuff that's easy to get out, okay? the stuff that was pretty efficient. And as that declines with growth-driven economies that we've got, what you're finding is um, a move towards what I call uh, extreme energy, okay? So those sorts of energy um, processes which are much more difficult to extract, far less efficient, and much more risky. And there's a strong correlation between these and damage to society and the environment. So um, the most interesting elements of this are uh, related to the energy efficiency, for example, and the environmental damage. Principally what you see here is the more energy you use in the process, the less society actually gets to use. So we're heading towards this sort of picture now, and we mentioned the tar sands a minute ago. It's sort of the poster child of extreme energy because it's so grossly inefficient. In the old days, with conventional oil, you used to get one barrel of energy in and you'd get 60 to 80 usable barrels of energy out. And the tar sands is like one to three or one to six. So even if we were to carry on down this very destructive path, it's going to be grossly inefficient. The whole premise of the capitalist growth growth of the economy will be radically different to that which we've had before. If anything suggests that there's a time to change within the capitalist understanding of energy, that would be it. Add to that environmental destruction and climate change issues. Now is the time, really, we should be moving 100% to renewables and using what little carbon budget we've got left to actually move towards renewables. And the thing that's really appalling me, the moment we're going in completely the opposite direction, especially in the UK, with things like fracking. Okay, so I've been working on the social and environmental impacts of that for the last few years. Um, this is our website, Extreme Energy Initiative. Um, we've worked on the tar sands as well. Um, we've done some work in Lancashire on the planning process, uh, which we call effectively producing something akin to a collective trauma on the community up there. Um, so I can talk about that in the Q&A if anyone's interested. But just to give you a quick run through of the tar sands, monstrous, monstrous thing. Um, it can be seen from space, it's so large. It's grossly inefficient because you're getting oil from grains of sand, right? And it produces enormous amounts of waste like these, which the industry likes to call tailings ponds, which is uh, actually more like lakes of waste. Um, it's an enormous project. Uh, these, these little sort of, um, these massive trucks, I should say, uh, are so big that the drivers need um, a lift to get into the cabin. Huge things, and some people, in uh, Alberta in Canada, and some people have, have called it in a Tolkien-esque fashion, Canada's Mordor. Um, you can sort of see, see. 
Yes, there are a number, a number of films you can watch on YouTube to bring it home. Now this is fracking, okay? Um, less destructive in and of itself, but when you cluster it together, it's huge. So this is why I call it sort of tantamount to sprinting in the opposite direction. It's grossly inefficient, it requires an awful lot of land surface, uh, and is quite rightly uh, described as an ecological disaster zone. And nowhere is safe. You can have this very close to homes. There's no regulation in the UK that would stop it um, being next to someone's home, as, as in the US, as an example, for, of, a, of a waste pond outside someone's home. And uh, the corporate social responsibility side of it is, you know, often get a new playground if it's uh, allowed to be fracked on a, on a school property, for example. Not much of a trade-off. Um, farming is hugely impacted. Um, these are all peer-reviewed studies. It might look like I'm um, being a bit polemical, but these are all from academic papers. Huge impacts on farming. And local communities are suffering with 4,000 truck journeys per frack. It's incredible. Um, so if you can imagine that on sort of small rural roads in the UK, you can see why I think it's tantamount to sprinting in the wrong direction. Um, okay, and climate scientists are, are fairly unanimous with this. Uh, the whole idea of keeping it in the ground, obviously you're all heard of now but it's especially important to keep the less efficient stuff in the ground. Okay, there's more than enough conventional reserves to fry us all. So going for the less energy efficient stuff is literally madness. Um, and people know this. Um, the more people read about it, the more people are worried about it. And this is an example of one year in particular which really saw a proliferation of local groups. 2013, we had a handful of local anti-fracking groups in the UK. A year later, like that and now there are nearing uh, 400 uh, local anti-fracking groups in the UK so people are mobilizing because they realize it's such a threat um, some scholars have basically said look we, we might end up having fracking wars when really we should be um, moving towards renewables so the, the danger is that this stuff's taking a lot of energy out of people you know um, people's ability to, to mobilize and react to things in a sense, they're having to deal with stuff right on their doorstep, and that's what's happening in Lancashire at the moment. And what he drew attention to is this worrying relationship between governments and multinational corporations. And one of my um, wonderful colleagues, uh, Paul Mobbs, researched this, I'm sure some of you have heard of him. Um, this was during the, uh, the coalition government period, okay? And since then, it's become a much bigger picture. But it's a meticulous research project that highlights all the corporate connections and the lobbying um, to government. And the most incredible one, if this was any other country, it would be called corruption. Um, Lord Brown now, the lead non-executive director advising the government on energy policy, in the cabinet <coughs> office, an unelected position, at the same time as being the chairman of the UK's main fracking company, Cordrilla. An astonishing thing to be allowed to happen. So consequently, you know, people are cross offended and people are resisting and people are taking to the streets. Uh, and the other element we'd be looking at then is how the police have responded to environmental activist protests. So the last um, thing we've been doing is looking at this um, uh, policing strategy. And again, more worrying trends. Look at that activist description there, activism. Criminality. So anyone in this room who calls themselves an activist, in the eyes of this policing strategy, you are by definition a criminal. Sorry, is that UK? Yeah, 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 UK. So this is another articulation. Um, it's the College of Policing brochure, this one, okay? So have a look at that description of an activist to describe, I hope, most of my students. Okay, a person who believes strongly in political or social change and works hard to try and make this happen. Okay, and that line there is the line of criminality, the dotted line. You're allowed to show you disagree, but not make a change. There you go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've had people, amazingly, Lord Devin, of the um, chair of the, of the Committee on Climate Change, described for ad fracking protesters as domestic extremists. Wow. Yeah? Um, and then, anyone heard of the notorious prevent strategy in the UK? Okay. Well, um, meant to be about uh, preventing counter-terrorism strategy, etc. Um, this is basically a leaked document that came from a school um, in the north of England. And um, a police officer was meant to be teaching the staff on how to spot potential extremism in their students. 
And if you look at the bottom here, I'm not sure you'll be able to see it, but basically he said the local police, East Riding's main priorities at the moment are far-right extremism, animal rights, <laughs> and anti-fracking. <laughs> You know, uh, and before that, it, was, it mentioned the same sentence as um, Islamic State. So, all lumped together. So, um, just to finish up then, um, the, the human responsibility side, apart from energy, this is the thing that isn't talked about much in my mind. I think there's a, a considerable amount of potential for making a difference here. You all hear about housing and transport. There's very little discussion about what Annie Leonard called stuff buying things that you don't need. So goods, so the average um, best part of 10 tonnes of CO2 per year that a British person uses, 5.8 of that is goods, buying things. So when I've been um, going to climate change seminars by climate scientists, they more often than not say, we just buy too much stuff. And that's not talked about enough. There's a lot about housing, energy, and heating, and transport, and actually the lion's share of it is stuff. So it's an obvious potential solution there. I think uh, Paul Mobbs, in his talk on this, he says we need to go back to 1950s patterns of consumption, where you can repair things, for example. Um, and his talk used to be called less is a four-letter word. Um, <laughs> and then finally, um, the other element which I think we can have an impact on um, is this sort of mad dimension of global capitalism whereby we can send the same types of food out of our country as we import, having a massive carbon footprint with unnecessary trade. So a Danish government study showed that one kilogram of food traded globally generates 10 kilograms of carbon dioxide. And then this marvellous illustration at the bottom from the New Economics Foundation, UK imports of almost the same amount of quantity of potatoes, <coughs> chocolate-covered waffles, milk, cream, and boneless chicken, and uh, gingerbread biscuits as it exports it. Um, so the elements of human agency in this, I think, are often ignored in these discussions. Um, so I'll finish on that point. Please.